book of Galatians, Galatians chapter number 6. Hope you had a good season of prayer with your prayer group. I want to talk to you about a very important subject tonight. We'll move through this slowly and hopefully you'll get some, some help from the scripture and it'll help us each one in this area. I want to talk to you about restoring the fallen, restoring people that have fallen away. It happens. I want you to think just for a moment, possibly, of someone that you know, and it may even be yourself, because you can fall away and still be in church. You do understand that. I think you understand that, that you don't have to be out of church to to be away from the Lord or to be um, fallen. You can fall in the church just as well as you can fall out of the church. And so I want to talk to you about restoring, the ministry of restoration. Now, we all know that the Bible teaches that uh, God has given to us, to the, the church, the ministry of reconciliation. We have that ministry of reaching the lost. Uh, God was in Christ, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, reconciling the world unto himself. And uh, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, of bringing men to God that they might have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to have peace with God is to have your sin forgiven, to be justified. Uh, Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we're involved in winning the lost. And I don't think I would have to in, you know, convince anybody here of that. I, I just don't. But, you know, I think a, a, a missing ministry in many churches is the fact that we should be involved in winning the saved. Now, listen to me carefully. You see, we, we, when you talk about winning the lost, a lot of Christians, they understand, they get it, they, 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 they realize it, even if they don't participate in it. They, they still realize. I, I don't know very many people, if I were to tell you, hey, listen, uh, we're, we're cutting out all outreach here at Fellowship Baptist Church. I don't know too many people would be pleased with that. You know, I don't, actually, I, I don't know too many people still hang around. Not in a good Bible-believing church if you just say, you know, we're cutting out outreach. We're, we're going to, you know, our missions program, we're shutting it down. No more soul winning visitation, no more outreach. Uh, we're, we're just shutting it down. I don't know too many people that would say, you know what, that, that's a good thing. And yet, I do want to remind you that there are many, many churches that have just completely shut down their outreach. They have zero outreach. And so wh whether you participated in it or not, you realize that it's something that a church should be doing. And if you do not participate in it, I want to encourage you to. And then I know that you have to realize, you know, I should be participating in the outreach ministry of my local church in some way. And a lot of people here at Fellowship do. Now, yeah, you, you, some people think, well, you know, if I'm not at soul winning visitation on Saturday, I'm not participating in the outreach ministry of my local church. There are so many ways that each one of us can participate in the outreach ministry of our local church other than being at Saturday soul winning. Amen? You understand that, right? Everyone understands that. I hope that you do. Don't. Now listen, I hope that you'll come and, and go out with us on Saturdays, but there's bus visitation, there's personal evangelism where you just invite people. Every day we, we, we have opportunities uh, for outreach through some avenues, and we should be involved in that. So that's, that's reconciliation. But what about restoration? That's winning the lost. What about winning the saved? What about people that were saved and they've fallen back, they've completely gotten out of church, they backslid? That's the word. Now, the word backslid, as far as I know, and if I'm wrong, you come to me. If you can you correct me, I, I, I would stand corrected. Don't think the word backslid or backslide is even in the New Testament. It's an Old Testament uh, word. Of course, the teaching is in the New Testament, but the word itself, uh, backslide or backslider. Uh, here in Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul uses this terminology in, in verse number 1. He said, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, 
And uh, that's the terminology. In other words, it's, if, he's, if he's been overcome, he's, and we're going to talk about this, he's been broken. All right? He's been broken. And so we're going to talk about the broken brother. Now, I think everybody sitting in here tonight could think in their mind, I know somebody that used to be in church faithfully, they, but they was more than just in church. They were serving God. They were walking with the Lord. They had fellowship with the Lord. They, 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 they had the peace of God in their life. They had victory, right? The joy of the Lord. And then something happened. Now tonight, we're going to talk about suddenly, okay? Now, the book of James, and the Lord willing, next week we may take that up. The book of James talks about when someone gradually gets away from God. But here, it's suddenly. And I think we've all known someone. I mean, they're, they're, they're seemingly doing good, then, boy, I mean, they're just gone. You just wonder, what happened? Watch what Paul says here. Brethren, if any man be overtaken, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's got a, a suddenness to it, right? You know, it's just... It's kind of like a man's walking along and then bam, he's just, you know, boy, he's, he's, he's blindsided. When, when you look at that word overtaken, it, it does carry that connotation to it. It's blindsided, uh, sabotaged. It's just, you know, someone just, just attacked, surprise attack. And they didn't see it coming. And I think that all of us in our Christian experience have had something similar to that to happen. Now, some people withstand it. You know, I mean, that, like Paul said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, I'm down, but I'm not out, right? And so some people kind of, they, they, they withstand that, that, that blindsided hit, that, 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 that attack of the devil that, that sets them back a little bit, and, and though it's, it, they, they get a little off track, they just kind of regain themselves, and then they, 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 they move on. However, there's a lot of people that do not. So what is the responsibility of me? What is your responsibility? When we see someone that has been overtaken in a fall, when someone's been blindsided, when someone goes down, right? When they go down, when they go out, what do we do? Well, Jesus gave a parable, and we, we know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan and and it's great teaching in that. But I want to take this right here. Okay, I want to take these scriptures and talk to you about what you can do, what I can do, and really what not only we can do, but what we should do. What we should do. I believe every person in here knows someone. It may be someone in your family. It may be a neighbor. It may be someone you used to be friends with here at church. Maybe they don't even go to this church. They used to go to another Bible-believing church, and, and now you've just noticed they're not in church anymore. They never mention Things that go on at their church, they never mention their walk with God or, or their, their Bible reading or their fellowship with God. So what can we do? Well, first of all, we should do something. We should get involved when people are overtaken. Notice what he said here. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Now, I, I believe when, when I, I look, there's a couple of words I want to talk to you about here. Let's look at that word fault. All right, look at it. I looked it up, and this is what it means. Falling aside a breach in the law of God to fall from truth. All right, so it, it, it's not, it's, we, we, we like to put titles on things, you know. And I think what Paul, and I think the Spirit of God did it on, on, for a purpose. And that is that we don't start categorizing when we should and when we shouldn't. I believe if you see your brother go down, y'all try to help him. I just believe that. And I, I, we're going to see why in just a moment. So the first thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes is ministry. See, we ought to get involved in the ministry of restoration. It's a needful ministry in our churches today. There's a lot of hurting people that profess the name of Christ. They're hurting and I want to say that as a pastor, I should be leading the way in that. Every pastor should be leading in this ministry of restoration. Now, I want to make it very clear before I go any further that 
When I say getting involved in the ministry of restoration, I do not mean uh, uh, turning a blind eye to people's sin. I, I do not mean that excusing their sin and, and enabling them or pampering them as they continue in their sin. That is not what I'm going to speak to you about tonight. And actually, I couldn't speak to you about that from the Scripture because the Bible knows no such thing. The Bible knows that what we should do and what it teaches is what we should do is we should maintain our stand in truth, but we should approach those that have fallen in compassion. So when I'm going to try to help somebody, I'm going to help them without, without taking a step away from where my stand is, but I'm going to reach out a hand to them in compassion, but in truth. In other words, I'm not going to just try to water it down and say, well, it's okay. Well, you know what? If, if they're in sin, it's not okay. Say amen now. If a person's in sin, it's not okay. But now the way I treat that is going to be very pivotal in the way that I'm going to be able to minister to them. Let me give you an example. So you're, you're, you're going to church with a man, and his son gets involved in, in some activity with some peers and he, he gets involved in things that a Christian should not be involved in, could be drinking, could be carousing and, uh, you know, reveling, it, it involved in, in questionable activity, all right? So you go up to him and say, brother, you know, I, I seen your son out, and it seems like he's really gotten ungodly. I mean, he's just wicked. I don't know that really you're going to be able to tell that man anything that's going to help him at all. Actually, I don't think he'll probably want to hear anything you have to say. You say, well, preacher, it's true. Well, <laughs> uh, sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it. Sure. There's other things you can say other than that. And so we have to be very careful, and the Bible teaches that, and we're going to look at it here in just a moment. We have to be very careful in how we approach people who have fallen, who are going through difficult times. All right, so let's look at it. Number one, the word brethren, it's for us. Paul's addressing the church. I should take the lead as the pastor. If you are if you're got the call of God on your life as a pastor, as a deacon, as a leader in the church, you should be right alongside of me. And if you are a member, if you are saved in the grace of God, every Christian, he said, brethren, brethren, if any man. So that means you. So you should be involved in this ministry, Okay. And the ministry is the ministry of not reconciliation, we're going to talk about restoration. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we realize that they've been overtaken. All right? They've been overtaken. They're going to need some help. They're going to need some help. In other words, they're not going to uh, be able to uh, bounce back on their own for the most part. Now, I say that some can, and, and I have uh, seen those that could, but most will not. So they're going to need a little help, and that's why Paul said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye, which are spiritual. All right? Now, there are folks that are saved, but that are not spiritual. Right? They're carnal. And Jesus taught about them, and I'm not, you can write this scripture down. He taught about the Pharisees. And hypocrites over in Matthew 23. And he said, you know what they do to people that are fallen? They just, they just pile more stuff on them. In other words, they go to them and they lecture them. Now, the last thing that a man needs is for me to lecture them when they have been overtaken, when they have fallen. They do not need lectures. Amen. They need compassion. They need Scripture. Give them Scripture to help them to rebound. Give them, give them truth. But don't lecture, don't talk down to people. You know, sometimes I fear that people think that, you know what, I would never do what you've done. Well, now, you might not. But I wouldn't bank on that. Amen? I'd be careful about having that mindset. And I think that's what Paul has in mind here. Brethren, if any man be overtaken to fall, ye which are spiritual... You want to be spiritual, what are you going to do? Restore. All right? Now, carnal Christians gossip. 
Carnal Christians are not involved in the restoration process. Carnal Christians are, are involved in the gossip of it, the hearsay of it. Hey, did you hear? <laughs> right? Have you heard? And they want to just keep it swirling. They want to pile on. Well, Jesus said, well, you know what? I want you to turn there. Matthew 23. Notice what Jesus said. He said, they just pile on. He said, you know, these hypocrites, these Pharisees, the, these, these legal-minded people, when someone falls, it's almost like they're excited about it. And, and so Matthew 23, look if you would in Matthew chapter 23. This is, of course, that, that chapter of rebuke against religion. And in verse number 4, Jesus said this, when he's speaking of the, the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, he said in verse number 4 of Matthew 23, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're not willing to help anyone bear their burden. They're not willing to help anyone get up after they've been knocked down. They just want to keep piling on. Just keep adding to it. Well, you should have known better. I tried to tell you. Right? The lectures. The, 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 the pharisaical, hypocritic way of, of trying to restore. It's not a restoration at all. It's just it's a way of adding to the problem. Back to uh, Galatians chapter 6. Here's some steps. Number one, he says, spiritual brethren... Get involved in the restoration process because he said, gee, what your spiritual restore. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to go to the brother. Now, listen, it can, it can be uncomfortable at times. Even as the pastor, it, it, it becomes sometimes a little uncomfortable, and, and it's going to become uncomfortable for you. If you're going to help people, you're going to have to learn how to get out of your comfort zone because you're going to have to be able to talk about some things that maybe are not so comfortable. And you're going to have to put yourself in places and, and positions to where to, to, to bring it up may cause a little bit of awkwardness. But in order to help people, you've got to be willing to go there. All right? So if I'm going to help people, I've got to understand that I'm going to have to do the hard thing. I'm going to have to bring this up. Not, listen, when a person's been overtaken, few people that have been overtaken are going to approach us. We're going to have to approach them. Now, I want to make a statement here because I've got it written down to make later, but I'm going to make it here while it's on my mind. I would to God that every Christian that got in trouble like this right here would just run to the church. I would to God they would. But you know, that's the exception and not the rule. Most Christians run from church and not to church. Now, they say they do it because of the gossip and, and they'll be judged. And, you know, uh, there is some truth to that. Whether we want to admit it, we may not like it, but there is some truth to it. That doesn't excuse the fact that they shouldn't come and get some help at the church. This ought to be a place where a person that has gotten into some trouble, a person that has fallen, a person that has been overtaken, could come limping in and say, I need some help. Preacher, I've, I've, I've messed up. And not feel like that I'm going to get up here and, and, and point them out and, and, and just, you know, take what they've told me and just blow it up and talk about it and, and put them on full blast, as the young people say these days, and just make it all about them. What a terrible testimony. What a terrible way to think you're helping somebody. You're, you're scarring that person maybe for life. You're building an... Uh, uh, an anger, if not a bitterness in their heart, to where they would never want to be back in a church again. And so when you know someone that way, and, and I, I'm just going to, I don't really know any other way to say it, just keep your lips closed. Just keep your mouth closed, okay? Don't, don't be talking about things like that. If you have anything to say, go to them, or, or, or uh, just go to the Lord. You know, tell God on them. Right? So he said, brethren, if any man be overtaken, that word overtaken, I told you what it means. It means caught off guard, blindsided, ambushed, restore. It means to place, to mend a broken or fractured bone. Now, I've never broken a bone. I don't think. 
uh, in, my, in my life. I, I, I haven't. I'm, God's blessed me. And, but I've heard that resetting a bone can be very painful. And you have to be really, really cautious. Uh, you know, you just can't go in and, and handle, you know, just, just flippantly and, and, and just start moving stuff around. You've got you to gotta be deliberate. And, and you have to be very conscientious of the pain that this individual's in and, and what's going on. Well, that's why I believe the Holy Spirit of God told Paul to use this very strong word, restore, broken. When a person is in this condition, Paul was saying they're broken and they need mended. They need some help. As I say, they don't need our criticisms. They don't need our lectures. They don't need our judging and our, 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 our um, long list of what should have and should not have been done. They need compassion. Give them some scripture. We don't want to excuse their sin. Sometimes when a person gets in this condition, they start feeling sorry for themselves. Is there anybody in here that has never felt sorry for themselves? Sometimes when a person takes a fall, sometimes when a person gets away from God, they start feeling sorry for themselves. Or let me say we start feeling sorry for ourselves. And we want people to, to come and we want them to just pamper and, and, and feel sorry for us. That's the last thing you need when you're, when you're in this condition. What you need is a friend who will look you in the face and say, here's a problem, but I want you to know something. I'm here to help you through this problem. This problem has not changed the way I feel about you. When I'm speaking to somebody in this kind of condition, that's one of the first things I try to tell them. When they tell me, listen, I've done something that's terrible, and they tell me, they disclose what they've done, the first thing I try to tell them is, okay, I want you to know something. That doesn't change the way I feel about you. It may change your fellowship with God. It may change your fellowship with the person you've done it with. I'm disappointed in you, but I love you and I care about you. I want to help you. I want to help you through this. And that's what Paul said. He said, restore. Now, is it going to be a little painful? Well, have you ever had a bone restored? You had a bone set? Could be a little painful, right? So you can't pamper now. You've got to say, hey, look, here's what you need to do. And then you lay out some scripture and begin to help people. But Paul said, as you do that, Here's the way you approach it. Look at it carefully. Restore such a one. Number one, he said, do it gently. Write that word down. You've been around people and, I mean, they're just rough as a cob. You know? I mean, they just, uh, they wouldn't know gentle if it slapped them in the face. They're just constantly just berating and, 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 and talking down to people. And you're wondering, and how is this helping? So notice what he said here. He said, do so, restore such a one humbly. The spirit of meekness. You say, well, uh, what he said he done, I've never done that. Well, just consider that you could. You say, I know I, know I couldn't. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says not only to do it uh, gently, but do it humbly. Why? Look at what he said. He said, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The temptation that he fell in, you might be next. Is that what he said? Sure is. So, we want to do it gently. Right? We want to work with the person, realize they're hurting. Realize that they don't need lectures and talk down to. They need truth. They need straightforwardness. This, you don't have to beat around the bush with them now. Just lay it out. This is what God says. I still love you. I care about you. You've messed up. I I'm disappointed in you, but I want to help you. I care about you. And I'll be here as long as it takes to help you. This, listen, there are no quick fixes to things like this. This is not going away tonight, my friend. Right? That's what you need to let people know. This is not going away tonight. But I'm going to stick with you through this. And I want to help restore you, listen, not just back to, to, to where you, you feel good again. I want to restore you back to a place of usefulness. One of the things that, that I try to teach here and one of the things I try to practice here is when we get involved in restoration, we don't want to just restore people back to church. I want to restore them back to fellowship in good standing with the Lord Jesus Christ 
so that he can use them again. God saves Christians to use them. And when they're broken, they can't be used the way God intends to use them. And so part of what we want to do is restore them back to a place of usefulness. I wrote this down many years ago. Someone asked Charles Haddon Spurgeon this question. When a brother has fallen, when can he again serve? I like this answer. He said, when his repentance is as great as his sin. Good answer. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. That's why he used the word restore. So ministry, okay? Ministry. Then the manner. How are we to do it? He said, do it gently, lovingly, thoughtfully. And then he said, do it humbly. What did Paul write in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 12? He said that, you know, you ought to consider thyself, but he said that we ought to take heed uh, lest we also fall. And that what he said is, I think that's 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Somebody can look that up. He said that, you know, you, you, you want to be careful about the way you conduct your life and you want to consider yourself, but he said, take heed. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he also fall. And that's what Paul was saying here. Look, if you would, again, in verse number one, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, the songwriter said, but there go I, but for the grace of God. So when you're ministering to that person, you remember something. It could very well be you the next time. Oh, a preacher, I'd never do that. Well, that's what Peter said, but he did it. Okay? I've, I, I've sit across and heard many of them say it. They've come to me, well, I think we ought to do this. I think we ought to do that to so-and-so. Uh, you know, and I try to say, well, you know, I think we ought to exercise patience. I think we ought to exercise the ministry of restoration. Well, you know, I just think that's inexcusable. I'd never do that. They did it. It's really strange how their mind and their heart change when it happened to them or somebody in their family. See, I'm not saying that, that that ought to trump what God says. I'm saying that this, mat this is what the Word of God says matters, whether it happens to you or not. But sometimes things like that have a way of humbling us, doesn't it? We get this idea that, well, you know what, I would never do that. I'm above that. I'm above this. And I, I look down on other people. Well, now, you be careful. You're not all that you think you are. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and I put this on social media, and I think I made some people upset, but that's okay. He also said that when people speak ill against you, don't be angry uh, uh, at them. You're worse than they're saying that you are. Amen? You know, sometimes somebody says, well, you know, he's this, and people just get all blowed up. You know why? Full of pride. Rather than that, our very best, we're sinners. We're sinners. And so uh, you be careful about puffing up with pride. You know, well, I don't appreciate him calling me a sinner. He just called you what you were. Amen? And so be very cautious. So he said, do it in what? He said, do it in the spirit of meekness. Do it gently. He said, do it in the spirit of humility. Consider yourself. I wrote this down. I want you to think about this. Someone said, the chair that you sit in, there's three people sitting there. Now think about this. The chair that you're sitting in tonight, there's three people. Number one is who you are. Number two is who you could be if the devil had his way with you. And then number three is what you should be if you'll let God have his way with you. You say, well, I've given everything to God. Well, God bless you. I don't think there's a person in here that could stand up and say, I'm doing everything God wants me to do, and I'm doing, I, I'm doing everything. God's getting His best out of me. So you're who you are. You're who you could be if the devil had his way with you. And don't you ever forget that now. Or you're who you should be if God had His way with you. And we need to constantly keep that in our mind. You know, I know some people, they're good folks. And better than many of them, I, I'm their pastor. And I love them. I love them. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a pastor that didn't love his sheep. And I mean that. 
And I hate to see them in the condition that they're in. It bothers me. And I think it ought to bother you. I think it does, many of you. You know people that's right here out of our fellowship, and it bothers you. Maybe people live in your own family. You've seen some in your own family grow cold and indifferent, and it bothers you. Well, it should. But I wonder if it's bothering us to the place where it moves us to the ministry of restoration, to where we would reach out to someone and tell them, hey, I had you on my heart in my prayer time this morning, and I just wanted you to know that I care about you. I'd like to meet you for a cup of coffee, or I'd like to, I'd like to set up a time to meet with you and talk with you because I want to help you. You see, when people are on hard times, brethren, they need that. They need that. And you never know where you wouldn't be in that place. All right? The manner of, of this ministry is to be done gently, humbly, and then sympathetically. Now watch what the Scripture says here. Look at verse number 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. Bear ye one another's burdens. Now that doesn't mean, when I say sympathetically, I don't mean going and, oh, you poor thing. That's not what Paul's saying here. Look at what he said here. It's almost with an empathy. He said, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now look right up here at me for a moment. What is the law of Christ? Think about that. Now, so we're, we're moving now from the ministry of restoration to the manner of restoration to the motive. What should prompt us to reach out to people that have fallen, that are broken? Paul said it's right here. It's the law of Christ should do it. But what is the law of Christ? Well, we know the law of God. Someone has said the law of Moses has ten commandments, but the law of Christ has one. If you'll look back just for a moment in chapter 5, Paul just got through telling us what that was. In Galatians chapter 5, look if you would in verse number 14. Galatians 5, verse 14, the Bible says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the law of Christ. Love. Not law. It's not law. And I know that there's times when, when people do, and, and listen, I get frustrated like you get frustrated. All right? When you have worked with someone and worked with someone and they continually or, or, or they just go against our counsel or they continually just, just jump off the precipice. So, so when do you draw the line? Well, I can't say. I don't know. I, I just think every situation warrants a different response. But I can tell you this. There's someone in me, by the grace of God, that's made it very difficult for me to give up on people. Because I'm glad that God never gave up on me. And I don't say that to try to make this emotional. It's just so, brethren, it's so. There may be somebody right now that you're thinking of and you think, you know what, I'm angry at them. Because I told them this was coming. And they did it anyway and they went headlong. And now they're out of church, they're out of God's will, and they've fallen and they're broken. Let somebody else help them. Maybe you feel that way. I have to be honest with you, sometimes I do. For a little while. And then God says, now Dale, son, is that the way you should feel? Yes, it is, Lord. No, it's not, Dale. You're right, Lord. It's not. It's not. But I told them. Yeah, I've told you too, Dale. I've told you too. Now you, you pray for them. And when you and I begin to pray for people, it makes it much easier to love them, no matter what they've done. And so he said, bear ye one another's burden, in verse number 2, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is love. That is what motivates me. That is what motivates you to, to look at these folks and realize, you know what? They're in the, the tempter's snare. The psalmist called it the, the snare of the fowler. They're in the tempter's snare. They have fallen to the vices of the wicked one. And we need to reach out to them and minister to them. 
Well, they'll find their way back, preacher. I can't find anywhere in this section of Scripture that says that they'll do that. They need me to help them. They need you to help them. Who are you helping? Who are you helping? You say, well, preacher, I'm not helping anyone. Well, it can't be because you don't know someone that needs help. And I'm not saying that to try to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to try to prod you and shake your mind, you know, rattle your cage a little bit and say, hey, now, we, we, we need to get involved in this ministry of restoration. You know someone hurting, God may be dependent on you, and he may be moving on your heart. Go to them. Speak to them. Has someone ever helped you? Well, yes, they have. Well, don't you think you ought to help someone? Amen? Where, where would you have been? Where would I have been if no, no one helped me? Well, who's going to help them? Someone needs to help them. If God has laid someone on your heart, don't come and tell me about it. Now, I don't mean that to be, I really don't, to, to, to be mean-spirited. But if God laid them on your heart, so you would go to them. Now, you may come and ask me to pray with you about it, but if God put them on your heart, you go to them. And you tell them, I'm concerned about you. <coughs> What's going on? How can I help? How can I help? You don't have to get into detail. Just how can I help? I've been praying for you. What can I do? What's going on? Something's not right. Give them some scripture. Challenge them. Spend some time with them. Give you this last truth and then I'll be through tonight, okay? I want you to notice when he said in verse number 2, so we've talked about the ministry of restoration, the manner of restoration, and then the motive of restoration. When you look in verse number 2, it says, bear you one another's burdens. You see that word there? This is what that word burden means. It means an oversized weight. Something that's overwhelming. And so there's just times when a person's going through things, they need your help. They need my help. We understand that, right? We're to bear one another's burdens. Look at verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he has nothing, he deceiveth himself. Beware of people who are always telling you, I've got this. This is very poor grammar, but it's great theology. They don't got this. Okay? How many times have we said, oh, I've got this, I've got this. No, you don't got this. If God hasn't got it, you haven't got it. And there's just times that God will, will make a situation to where you're going to have to depend on someone else. I'm going to have to turn to someone else. No man liveth unto himself and no man dieth unto himself. So he said in verse number 3, if you think yourself to be something when you're nothing, you're deceiving yourself. Look at verse number 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, what's the difference in verse 2 and verse 5? Well, there's, there are some difference. In verse number 2, the word burden is an enormous weight. In verse number 5, it's a backpack. Exactly what the word means. It's a backpack. There's just some things that you've got to do for yourself. And we've got to teach these people that we're trying to restore, we've got to teach them that. You have to accept responsibility. And you've got to bear some things of your own. I'm not here to do this for you now. I'm here to help you through this. Amen? See, if we're not careful, we'll go running to their, to their rescue and we'll try to do it all for them. That's, that's not good. We are to help them. We're to bear one another's burdens. But we are to teach them there's some things they're going to have to bear themselves. I'll give an illustration, and I hope this will help you before we have prayer. So I'm carrying my children to school. My car breaks down, okay? And my neighbor comes along, and I say, Hey, look, can you take my children to school because the car's broke down? Sure. So my children get in the vehicle with him, and he takes them to school. Now, he's bearing that burden. He's helped me out. But now I don't expect him to, to feed them. I don't expect him to clothe them. That, that's my burden. That's my burden. So there's just some things I've got to do. 
Okay, I'm their father. There's just some things I've got to do, but there may be an occasion where I'll need some help in doing some things that I need to do. And that's the, what these scriptures are teaching. All right? And so there's just some times we need help. I know people that right now are out of church because they needed help and they wouldn't get it because they said, I've got this. I've got this. Right out of church. I've got this. I kept, kept saying it until they're completely out of church, out of the will of God, and it's, it's sad. So don't be an I got this person, all right? Let's, let, let, let someone help you, and don't be ashamed to go to someone and say, hey, I need some help. I need some help. I think one of the hardest things to do is realize when your spiritual barometer is dropping, and, 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 and you, you realize, I need some help, but you won't tell somebody. Hey, look. I, I used to read my Bible every day. I hardly ever read my Bible anymore. I used to love to come to church. Now I have to make myself come when I come, and I don't always come. I rarely think of spiritual things anymore. Hey, you're in trouble. Listen to me. You're in trouble. And you need to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm in trouble. Don't wait until you've fallen off the cliff to get some help. All right? And if you know someone that has, go to them. Get involved in the ministry of restoration. I pray that people, as we stand to our feet, when they think of Fellowship Baptist Church, you know, we're known in the community, and I, I think you know this, I'm known as a lot of things, but uh, we're, we're known as the, you know, the strict church. You know, the strict church. They have a dress code down there. Well, you better believe we do. I think every church does. Amen? Anybody here don't think the church has a dress code? Huh? I think our churches have dress codes. We just, have, uh, we just draw lines at different places. They, they expect you to come to church down there. That's why we have it. Amen? Just good, straight, biblical things. And we're known for that. However, among all those things that we're known for, there's also people that say, you know what, those people down there, they, they're kind people. Those folks, have, you know, I've, met, I've had people tell me when I'd be going through the line at a Walmart somewhere and I'd give them a gospel, yeah, I had a guy come through here and he gave me one of these. Nice family. I've actually had people call the, the church and, and leave their name and say, you know what, I met a family from your church and I've got to tell you, just the nicest people and, and it was a pleasure to meet them. Hey, that makes a pastor feel great. And so I want you to know that. Let's, let's stay in the ministry of reconciliation and restoration. All right? You can, you can still stand on truth, be kind, and love people and help them. Amen? Just do it gently, humbly. Very important. Let's bow our heads together. Who do you know?